We were there, and we went through the word relax as an acronym. How many of you remember what they stood for? R was for rejoice, rejoice, right? Celebrate. That's one of the things. Is, these are how we, how we can learn to walk in peace. R was rejoice or celebrate. E was experience God, right? We can actually have a tangible, real, day-to-day experience with God. And then L was two things. List and what's the second one? Oh gosh, we've got to learn to leave. We need to list and then leave our requests with the Lord. Remember we talked about the fact we don't bring a tent to the mechanics. Or we don't bring a tent to the Apple store. When we bring our phone to the Apple store to get fixed, I'm just like, I'm just going to stay here till you get it done in case you need me. You know, uh, we don't do that with God. We leave our requests with God. And then A, right, R-E-L-A was ask for help. We're getting a little weak on the A. Ask for help. Okay, ask your neighbor what A was, okay? Ask for help. We live in biblical community. We're not meant to do life alone, so we rejoice. We experience God. We list and leave our requests with God. We ask for help, and then X was what? Focus on good things or on gratitude, because gratitude and anxiety cannot occupy the same heart, okay? So you're caught up. So today, I want to start by telling you a little story that uh, will kind of give you some of the idea of where we're headed. It's about Morgan, actually. I have a picture of around the time when this happened. Uh, This is Morgan, little Morgan. And uh, he was a cutie pie, always had this little glint in his eye, even when he was that old. Now, when Morgan was little, he struggled a little bit with, well, possibly a lot of things that required him to sit down and be still, um, which is probably no surprise to any of you. And so for a long time, he insisted on having like Velcro shoes. But the time came where Morgan, in order to pass for, uh, kindergarten, had to learn how to tie his shoes. And he worked and worked and worked at it. And he finally was able to tie his shoes. He, you know, yeah, he still does. He still does it on his own. Congratulations, Morgan. <laughs> So we're still proud of the fact that he can do that. He doesn't often still sit still very well, but he does, he has tied his shoes. Now I can remember this vividly. He was like really excited about it. And then all of a sudden, like there was this, this like moment where he just kind of got really sullen and, and quiet and, uh, like, like, like you just learned to tie your shoes, Morgan. Like you must be so excited. And he's, he's like, well, yeah. I am. And I'm like, well, well what's wrong? What's wrong? And, he was, and literally, he said this. He's like, but now I have to do it myself for the rest of my life. <laughs> right? I mean, which is totally, totally Morgan, right? He's always thinking ahead. It's like, if I do this now, they're going to expect this later, you know? And, and it, it was, it's, but we all have moments like that where we have like these great achievements that occur in our life and then we find ourselves feeling like flat, right? Like you have this amazing vacation, like you've been waiting for it forever, you could barely hold yourself still before you left and you had this amazing time and you get back and there's this lull or like you can't wait for Thanksgiving and you get all the family together again and, 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 and Thanksgiving dinner is happening and just like tears are running down your face. Everybody's together. This is so beautiful. And then, then you're washing the dishes and you're crying again because it's all over. And, and you know, next time we're not going to get together until Christmas. Like it's like we get or are constantly, our lives are on this rise and fall and rise and fall and rise and fall. They, they actually have a term for it. It's called post-holiday blues. You know, uh, it's like postpartum depression or something, I don't know, for the holidays, um, where we can kind of be exhilarated with this great time, and then all of a sudden kind of have this kind of thud where this kind of reality hits again. It just kind of seems how life goes. Anybody else kind of kind of connect with that? I know, like, being in ministry, there's that rise and fall of every weekend. You know, you do a sermon, and then it's like, you hope it's good, and then you think it's good, and then it's like, you're home. It's like, oh, it sucks. I don't know why I even did this. You know, like, it's, it's like that, or leading worship is like that. Like, you know, like, oh, God's so good. Isn't God so good, everybody? And everybody's like, yeah, God's good. And then you're driving home, like, oh, I can't believe I played that B flat that way. Like, I, like, it's just, we're constantly, we're constantly doing that, and it really doesn't matter. Like, sales is the same way. Those of you who are on sa- in sales, the, 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 the medical field is the same way. The highs and lows of life are kind of crazy. And I want to look at a story today 
um, of, a, of a prophet named Elijah. And uh, Elijah had one of these days. He had actually several days. Um, and uh, I can really identify with Elijah because of a lot of the things I've already said, right? But I want to kind of catch you up. This is at a time in Israel's kind of story where they don't look or act at all like Israelites. They've had several generations of kings that have led them away from the worship of Yahweh or God. And, um, and so God had the prophet Elijah confirm front the king Ahab um, and Jezebel, his wife, about leading the country into the worship of Baal or Baal um, and Asherah worship. Um, and he said, he basically said, you know, if you don't stop this, I'm going to pray and I'm going to stop rain. And it's not going to rain here again until I say so. This is what Elijah, right, comes up to the king, right? You're doing it wrong. I'm going to make it stop, stop raining and then it ain't going to rain until I say so, Right? And so it's pretty bold, okay? And so later, uh, God kind of sustained through this uh, whole time of famine, God sustained Elijah and a widow with a little uh, thing of flour and a little flask of oil that never, ever dried up, like a complete miracle for like three years. And then uh, earlier, or late, also in one of the times where he was traveling before the famine was over, Elijah, or sorry, God actually fed Elijah like with ravens. Like they showed up in the morning and at night with like meat and bread for him. Like it's like crazy. Okay, so this is kind of where we're at in the story. I want us to take just a second and look at this uh, little video that will get us caught up with the rest of how Elijah's story goes, how Elijah's day went. No rain fell in the land of Israel for three years. God was punishing the people for turning away from him to worship false gods. Without rain, the lakes and rivers dried up. People could not grow crops in the fields. Finally, God was ready to send rain. God told Elijah to go to Ahab, the king of Israel. So Elijah obeyed God. Elijah told the king, meet me at Mount Carmel. Bring the people of Israel and the prophets who worship false gods. King Ahab and the people met Elijah at the mountain. Elijah said, Make up your minds. If you believe the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Elijah set up a challenge to show who is the one true God. The prophets of the false god, Baal, set up an altar first and put a bull on it. Elijah said, Call to Baal and ask him to send a fire to your altar. I will call on the Lord. The God who answers by sending fire is the one true God. The prophets of Baal danced and cried out for hours, answer us, they said, but no one answered. Shout loudly, Elijah taunted them. Maybe he is sleeping, still no answer. Then the people gathered around Elijah. He set up an altar dug a trench around it, and put a bull on it. Elijah told the people to pour water on the altar so everything was wet. Then Elijah prayed, Lord, answer me so that these people will know that you, Lord, are God. God sent fire from the sky. It burned up the bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It dried up the water in the trench. When the people saw this, they fell face down and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Elijah had all the prophets who worshipped Baal killed. The sky grew dark with the clouds, and God sent a great rain. King Ahab told Queen Jezebel everything that Elijah had done. Jezebel wanted to kill Elijah, so Elijah fled into the wilderness. He walked to Mount Horeb. At the mountain, God spoke to Elijah and encouraged him not to give up. So that's a pretty amazing day. You know, you were just kind of hanging out. You've been three years since you have kind of boldly went into the king and told him you were going to tell him that it wasn't going to rain. And then you up the ante and you bring the king and 800 of his, uh, of his um, what is it? 
prophets. There we go. 800 of his, 800 of his prophets uh, to, to Mount Carmel. You're in front of the, like, the, a huge part of the country, and you bring them in this kind of bold, kind of like, you do this, and I'll do this kind of thing. And God shows up. Um, and, and I mean, it, it, it's bold. Like and when you read scripture, they don't say this because this is kind of for kids, but they're actually in scripture, it says that, um, that Elijah, when he was making fun of the priests of Baal was actually, well, maybe your God's on the toilet. And he's a little bit busy. Like, I'm sure he probably was a little more crass than that because I think that's just kind of the guy he was, but like, so the, so it's crazy, right? Like he's done all this. In addition to this, what it doesn't say is like when, when Ahab, like, like sees all of his priests get killed and he like runs home to his wife to tell her what's going on. It's a 30 mile journey. Okay. So he's the king on a chariot and he's, and he's tearing home to, to, uh, to tell his wife. And Ahab gets this supernatural strength, pulls up his, his cloak and outruns the chariot and like waits at his door. Like, Hey, how was that? Hey, where are you going to go talk to the wife? What's going on? Like, like he had this kind of bold swagger to him that was just kind of crazy to me. And then all of a sudden it, it takes this weird twist. Like he goes from like, like, like facing off to 850 of these priests in front of everybody and like running at least probably like 30 kilometers, not 30 kilometers an hour, 15 kilometers an hour, I think is how fast a chariot can run. So he he outruns a 15 mile an hour chariot, 30 miles to get, to get between Mount Carmel and Jezreel. And, and then all of a sudden he gets this note the next day from the queen. I'm going to get you. You're terrible. And, and it throws him off. Like you'd think he'd be like, all right, lady, let's go. You know, like what you got? Instead, he like gets completely overwhelmed like the next day. And he, and he runs off. And let's, let's pick it up in 1 Kings 19, 3 to 4. It says, Elijah was afraid, fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town, um, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there, and then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. You know, so Elijah, like, calls the king a troublemaker, sets up a public showdown, confronts the crowd of witnesses about their worship of false gods, right? He mocks them in the middle of the day. He ups the ante and completely drenches his sacrifice, so much so that the water runs down through the whole thing and fills a trench that encircles it. God miraculously answers fire from heaven, okay? He prays for rain, and the rain comes after three years upon him praying, and then he outruns a chariot 31 miles from Mount Carmel uh, on foot, gets hate mail from one woman, and completely caves, okay? (laughs) This is like the holiday blues, okay, at its best. Like, it don't get no more holiday and no more blue than what it did for Elijah. So I want to look at Elijah, because obviously, like, he's amazing, but he's also made some mistakes here. And so last week, we looked at some things that we can do that are positive uh, in order to walk in peace. But I want to take a quick look at this story with Elijah and look at four mistakes, common mistakes, that Elijah made that allowed him to be overwhelmed with anxiety, even after such an incredible way that God showed himself to him. And not, not like just once, right? Like for three years, God answered his prayer to not rain. I mean, and kept him fed the whole time, miraculously. And now all of a sudden in one day, he takes a turn. So I want to look at four common mistakes that Elijah made that kept him from remaining in this peace. Number one, Elijah ran himself to the ground. We run ourselves into the ground. Elijah was exhausted. (laughs) Like, I know what it's like to, like, preach for, like, 35 minutes in front of, like, you know, 60 of you. Uh, But, like, to stand up all day and mock 100 priests and then, you know, the anxiety and kind of the nervousness of what's God going to do when I pray and all that and then running 31 miles, the guy was tired. Like, you got to give him that. And, I mean, like, a total adrenaline, like, like, like rush, and then like collapse, right? So he was run down. He was so run down that what God did when he, when he got to the, um, got away was he just caused him to sleep for like two days. Like, like, Elijah, don't talk. All right, you're making a fool of yourself. Just have some rest, 
and, and like eat. Like, like God actually didn't even get him to go and get food. Like God had angels bring food to Elijah like, like two times throughout the day while he was resting. I mean, it's like the ultimate door dash, right? It's like, <laughs> it's like, like he didn't have to order it. Like uh, probably, he probably liked it. I don't know what it was, but maybe Chick-fil-A, I'm sure, even then. God, <laughs> God probably jumped in time, got him like a 12 count, right? With, with one of those milkshakes. Oh man, their milkshakes are good. And like, boom, like back in, back into Elijah's time. Like, hey, you got to try this. It's going to be really great someday. Um, <clears throat> So, so Elijah, mistake number one, like he ran himself to the ground. He just, he did not take care of himself physically. And so he just couldn't take care of himself emotionally. Number two, um, he shut out the people that were closest to him. He isolated himself, right? We just read, he went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there and then walked for an entire day. So he put a lot of space between him and his biblical community. And he went by himself. He did not ask for help. He shut people out. Thirdly, I think the thing that he did, so he, he, uh, he let himself get run down. He shut people out. And then he focused on the negative. All right, 1 Kings 19, 4. Then he went alone in the wilderness traveling and he prayed. Like, I've had enough, God, right? Uh, he, Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. So He's, he basically is now like looking like, oh, my dad did this, and my uncle did this, and I'm just like them. I'm no good. Just, just kill me too, right? He didn't focus on gratitude or focus on good things. He focused on the negative. He took that time to just get alone, away from anybody who could encourage him. He didn't think about all the things that God had just accomplished or any of that. He didn't rejoice. You know, he, he didn't ex- he experienced God, but he wasn't then other than to just basically tell God to take care of him. Um, and, and now it's like, woe is me, I am undone. And then fourthly, I think this is probably crazy to me because his name actually means God. Like, like Elijah actually means Elo, how, uh, sorry, Elijah actually means like God is with us. Uh, he forgot God. Like he forgot who God was. Like every step of the way, we do this. Don't we do this? I mean, I know I do this. I'm sure you do. We're human, but Elijah like just went through like a three-year-long crazy miracle that culminated in this incredible showdown with fire from heaven and supernatural speed. And 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 like at every moment in every situation, God was present. God had provided. God had protected. But Elijah forgets in one day. In one day. Like, we're all like this. In one day, he, forget, he forgets God. And so God does what I just mentioned. He gives him some space. Like, Elijah, let's not talk, okay? Sometimes, sometimes I need this. Like, Elizabeth's like, you know what? You should go have a nap, and then we should talk about this. Because um, sometimes, you know, I need a nap um, uh, to have the self-control and, the, 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 you know, the focus I need to, to have a conversation. And so God knew Elijah wanted to say, you know what, dude, like, Let's not talk right now. Don't, don't whine to me about your grandfather and your great-grandfather. I got them. I know where they are, all right? But let's just get you something to eat, all right? So they order dial-up Chick-fil-A, and God like, gets, gives him some space. And then after a little while, when, when, when God has kind of allowed Elijah's body to rest, like God could have like poof, Elijah into like shape, but he didn't. Like He let his body catch up. He let his emotions catch up. He let Elijah get some rest, and then he comes back, and, uh, and, uh, and the Lord said to Elijah, like, what are you doing here, Elijah? Like, what are you doing here? And Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Like, he has totally forgotten what just happened, Right? Like the whole country just repented, right? Like a few days ago. And God says, go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Um, 
and after the earthquake, there was fire, but the Lord was not even in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. A sound of a gentle whisper. Now, we read through this really quickly, but like, think about it. Like, like, there was like earthquake, like windstorm, fire. It takes some time for that to settle down. Like, it was noisy for a little bit. Like, Elijah was sitting there still like, okay, God, like, what's going on? Where are you? And then, then all of a sudden, after that all dies down, there's this whisper. And then God says again, Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah forgot God. God does these more really big things. Wind and earth and fire. And then in the stillness, God gently whispers, Elijah, where are you? Reminds me of another whisper God did in a garden one day. Rejoice in the Lord always is our key scripture. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. And then what's this next line? The Lord is what? The Lord is near. The Lord is near. The God was near, but he wasn't in the remarkable. And he was near, and he wasn't even in the ordinary. He was in the whisper. When we're overwhelmed by stress, when we're overwhelmed by anxiety, when we're inundated with negative voices and doubt and fear, when pain and hopelessness are shouting for us to give, us, to give up, why does God seem so silent, so quiet? Because God is near. When fear is like standing and screaming at you and telling you that you're terrified and that you're, you're going to be overwhelmed, God whispers, Isaiah 41.10, don't be afraid, for I'm with you. Don't be discouraged. I'm, I'm your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold up my righteousness. And you'll be victorious by my right when vulnerability and weakness steals your strength, comes into your neighborhood and takes everything you've got and you feel like you've got nothing left, God whispers, this is my commandment. Be strong, courageous. Don't be afraid or discouraged. I, the Lord your God, I'm near. I'm with you wherever when you're overwhelmed and your courage is gone and the enemy is screaming at you from a distance, God stands right beside you and he whispers, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. I am near. When your lack of security and you feel like the floor is falling out underneath you and you don't know what bad thing is going to happen next, God comes close and he whispers, even when you're at the end of your rope, when it doesn't look like anything's going to work out right, when the enemy is screaming at you, and maybe other people in your life are literally screaming at you, and you're wondering, where are you, God? I'm right here. I am near. Elijah wanted to die. He wanted to be killed. His greatest fear was that the king's wife was going to kill him. You know what's so crazy about God? You know what's crazy about the story of Elijah if you don't know it? Elijah is one of two people in the Bible recorded to have never died. 
that the story goes that Elijah was kind of had gotten his act together again, and he was walking with, with his protege, and all of a sudden, God showed up in a fiery chariot and separated the two and swept Elijah up into the chariot and took him to heaven. Elijah's greatest fear never even happened. He was anxious for nothing. Would you stand with me? And as you do, I invite you, if you're in the room today, to take your communion elements. God is near. What God wants you to hear today, loved ones, in a gentle whisper, is I am near. Slow down. I hear you all opening these up. I know I can, you can get anxious to get those things open. I know. That's why I don't even use it up here. <laughs> Be anxious for nothing. They will open. God became flesh. The Word became flesh, Scripture tells us. Took up residence. He moved into the neighborhood, as is said. God is near. And, and Jesus knew that we were going to need to be reminded that you're not alone. And so not only did he come physically and spend 30-some-odd years on earth and start this movement, that God demonstrated his love that while we didn't even know we needed him, and if we did know we didn't want him, he sent Jesus to come and die. And the day before that happened, Jesus brought those closest to him near him. He brought them near. Guys, let's, let's go up to a place and sit around a table. I've got some things I want to share with you. Let's, let's get close. Jesus brought them near. And in the middle of the, the dinner, he took bread. Hey, guys, listen, I, I want to I show you something. Uh, I've been talking about this for a while, but I'm going to die. But my sacrifice is going to make a way for you to become children of God, to receive the Holy Spirit. And he, at the dinner, while they were near, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body. This represents my body that's broken for you. That I can't be in one place at one time while I'm physical, but, but, but in a little while, the Holy Spirit's going to be here, and I'm going to be able to be near to all of you. We don't have to sit around the same table, but we can remember the table where I made the promise. And he said, this represents my body broken for you. Every time you get together, take, eat, and remember that I am near. To partake of the bread together. I'm sore that they got carried away after they did that. And uh, Jesus had to get their attention again. Like, hey, Peter, Peter, Peter. All right, enough stories already. All right, all right, all right. Luke, we don't need to know. All right, we all washed our hands. It's okay. You're a doctor. It's fine. We washed our hands. And he got their attention again. He said, guys, listen. We talked about the bread, but I, I want to talk about something else. And he took a chalice of wine and he poured it into a cup. And he said, this represents my blood. My blood's going to be spilt for you for the redemption of your sins. This is going to this is going to be a supernatural thing where my everlasting love is demonstrated because my blood's going to be poured out over the mercy seat of God. And you know, under the mercy seat in the in the uh, Ark of the Covenant was the law. If you know this or not, but when they built the Ark of the Covenant, Moses had the Ark of Covenant. Inside the Ark of the Covenant were the Ten Commandments, the law. And when they, when they killed, um, when they killed the, the fatted calf and they 
poured the blood over the mercy seat, and you think about where God is in the, in the temple, it meant that when God looked at the Ten Commandments, when he looked at the law, he couldn't look at the law without seeing the blood that was spilt. He couldn't. God knows what he's doing. Thousands of years later, after the Israelites have spent generations and millennia of pouring blood over top of the law so that when God comes to judge, he has to see the blood first. Jesus says, this is my blood that I've shed for you for the forgiveness of your sin. You can live in freedom. This everlasting blood will be between you and the law forever so that when God looks at you to judge you, the only thing he's going to see is this. This is it. I'm near. Don't forget. Today you can walk in freedom. Maybe you're in the room today and you've never made a a decision on your own that you're going to follow Jesus. You're going to you're going to make Jesus the Lord of your life. He already is Lord, but you've never made the decision to recognize him as Lord. You're not going to line up your thoughts, line up your behavior, line up your mindset with what his word says. This is available to you today to change your life forever. And I don't mean like just until you die. I mean forever because through this, we live eternally with God. And someday we'll live with him with our loved ones because of this sacrifice that we remember today. And so if you're in the room today, if you're watching online and you've never made a personal commitment to God to say, I want you to be Lord. I'm going to, look, I don't care what everything else says. What your Bible says is going to be true. I'm going to get with other people who love Jesus. I'm going to let them talk about how life goes. I'm going to learn from them. I'm going to live in biblical community. I'm going to be a part of something that I'm going to commit to. I'm going to be a part of a family. I'm not going to go to a church. I'm going to belong somewhere so that the things that bug them about me and me about them make us more like Jesus. I want to do that. If that's you today in the room or if that's you watching online, whether it's now or later, all you need to do is decide. All you need to do is decide. Repent, turn around, do something different. We pray, we call a sinner's prayer sometimes. There's nothing magical in that prayer. The power is in the decision to change your behavior to lean into the truth of Scripture and to submit yourself humbly before the Lord and His church. And so today I invite you, if this is the first time that you've ever decided to eat this bread and drink this cup in celebration of your new life, and those of us who've maybe had this meal before and are remembering again the freedom that God gives us to be children of God, to live above anxiety, to walk in peace and joy and love and righteousness, we drink to that. And we thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice that provides that freedom. So let's remember and partake together this morning. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness, may the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control be known to all. Father, we celebrate today with grateful hearts the reality of your freedom provided through your spirit when lived out amongst your people by your word. We look into tomorrow knowing that you've got it all. You hold it all. And we will be anxious for nothing. And when the enemy and our own voices of fear and anxiety and stress and doubt and hopelessness shout at us. We will stand, leave a little space for the storm to die down, and hear you whisper, I am near. And so, God, we go today 
as children of God with a good father who knows how to give good gifts even better than us earthly fathers do, who gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is your presence tangible with us in every breath, bringing life to ourselves and to neighbors and neighborhoods until you are first in every heart and in every home. God, may you birth that vision in every single one of us. May the desire to see our neighbors who are lost be found. May our desire to see our co-workers who are overwhelmed by the world know the freedom that there is in you. And Lord, in order for that to happen, we've got to experience it. And so Lord, I pray as the pastor of this church that you would overwhelm every heart and every mind and every family and every home with the power of your Holy Spirit that you would interrupt conversation, you would interrupt arguments, you would interrupt selfishness, you would interrupt adultery, you would interrupt all of the sin that it so easily encroaches us and screams at us, that you would interrupt it, oh God, by your Holy Spirit, that we would know you and the freedom that there is in you so that we can bring that life to our neighbors and our neighborhoods and our kids and our grandkids our co-workers, those who we see as we go along our day. God, make us new. Make us new. Help us to walk into the reality knowing that you are near. Amen. 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 God is good. Waterline, I love you. I love you. I love you. God is doing things in our hearts and lives. He is changing us and transforming us to become a force to be reckoned with, a force that brings life. And so walk in that life that's provided to you today, I pray. In Jesus' name, go with God. Be blessed today.